Yeah, as I had mentioned earlier, our pastor, as you can see, is not with us, he's the first lady. But we have one of us who is so blessed, and uh, he is going to bring the word to us. I'm talking of our brother George. Brother George is the one who is going to speak to us. The Lord has laid a word for him, uh, for us in him, and we pray that the Lord will use that word to minister to us. Let's commit our brother into the hands of the Lord as he comes to speak to us. Mighty and everlasting Father, we want to get come before you. We want to thank you for this special moment that we have assembled in your presence, Father, to hear your word. Your word is settled in heaven. And Father, you have laid the word for us today. A word for this day, for this season, on the heart of our brother George. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to minister to him as he ministers to us, Father. We speak a special anointing upon him, that, Lord, you will use him in a special way bring your word to us so powerfully and with clarity that Lord we will have no doubt when we leave this place that yes we had an encounter with you today we do not want to leave this place the same we walk in but rather we want to be blessed by your word we want to be ministered we have come empty in your presence, Father. Fill us as we go out. Meet every challenge that we have and every load that we have in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you will lift it off of, of our shoulders. And so, Father, I commit our brother to thy hands that he will speak to us in minding of every word that you have laid on his hand. We thank you, Father, we honor you. Help us to be keep doers and not just hearers of your word this morning. Help us to focus on you as you minister to us, coming against us in the distractions from the evil one. We thank you, Father, we are you. Be glorified and be exalted in this house and in this world that we are about to hear from you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. Amen and amen, amen. So please help me to welcome our brother, Minister John. as a present in the name of Jesus. So um, my name is George. I'm saved. I love the Lord. My personal Savior. And I'm not uh, ashamed to confess what he has done to me. Praise the name of the Lord. Um, I want to thank praise and worship team for that a great and wonderful job. Actually not the presence of God is such a powerful way we don't take it for granted. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to also welcome all the first time visitors. You know the first time visitors, the first time visitors after a long time. Praise the Lord. And uh, feel at home. I always feel encouraged when I see this family in the house of God. Um, Pastor Anderson asked me last week if I can study for him. 
and the one thing that I always say is I will never say no. I'm what you may say, no, it's not me. It's the name of the Lord. So whenever he calls me, I will, my answer is always the same, I will answer. It's not my portion to say I would, but I can't. I always say, yes, I'm here, Lord, use me as you can. Praise the name of the Lord. The other thing is I want to thank the SMT Church for all the support they have given to our pastor, to this ministry. The little coins you give has gone a long way to support this ministry. So I don't know, I don't, don't take that for granted. And because today I want to talk about a man in the book of, uh, I don't know how to say this name, because I grew up in Africa, in Kenya. And when I came here, it's, you know, I want to talk about Nehemiah. But Nehemiah is not Nehemiah here, it's Nehemiah. So for the purposes of this um, summer, if I don't say Nehemiah, it's only because I've not been used to. I'll be more than comfortable talking about Nehemiah or Nehemiah when they come to that. But I want to talk to you about a great, great man called Nehemiah. Now, of you that know that are that like studying the Word of God, the book of Nehemiah is one of the greatest books in the Bible. One of the greatest books. If you want to read about leadership, you want to see how a man can be used of God to transform things, go to the book of Nehemiah and you find that man there. Praise the name of the Lord. So today I want to talk about this man and I want to give a brief history about what, about, what I'm about to talk today before I start uh, my sermon. Now Jerusalem has always been um, a chosen city by God and for God purposes. Jerusalem was not just like any other city. It had a very special place in the heart of God. Because Jerusalem was a city that had the temple of God in it. It's a place that God was worshipped. And a place that God had personally chosen for him to be worshipped. Number two, Jerusalem had the Ark of Covenant. So it was a city that was closer to God than any other city. The city of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is a praise, a city of, of peace. And God liked to be identified with this city. Because in this city, there were men and women that God loved. Something else that you need to understand about the city of Jerusalem was it was built and surrounded by very high walls and gates. Meaning the security of Jerusalem was a concern of God. He did not want that city to be attacked from right to left side by the enemies. So the security of Jerusalem was so important in the eyes of God, that he made it sure that everything was good. Even David one time said, just as Jerusalem was surrounded by the mountains, so God has allowed his people. So security is very important to the city of Jerusalem. The other thing is, because of God's closeness to the people in Jerusalem, the neighbors hated Jerusalem. They hated Jerusalem and they hated the people in Jerusalem. And the people conspired and planned how they are going to attack and destroy Jerusalem because they knew that was a place of God. And because they were envious of the God of Israel, and the people knew that if we attack Jerusalem, we are going to attack the God of the people of Israel. They went out of their way to destroy Jerusalem. So sometimes back, 
uh, the Babylonians. They went and attacked Jerusalem. They destroyed the walls. They destroyed the gates. And I think that was not enough. They took all the strong men and the women away. So that Jerusalem was left a very desolate place with no people in it. The only people that were left in Jerusalem were the weak people, the old people, the sickly people. That's what was left in Jerusalem. And remember, this was the city of God. The question is where was God when all this was going on? The Jerusalem. Where was God when this city was being attacked? And what came into my mind is sometimes we claim we are, we are the chosen ones of God. That God is on my side. That God is my father. But sometimes you wake up in the morning and everything has gone wrong. Where is God in such circumstances? Praise the name of the Lord. We are coming to that. So, how many of you can remember the Cardinal the book of Daniel? Then Nebuchadnezzar was a king that destroyed the last bit of, of, of Jerusalem. And he was such a non arrogant reader. He feared no God. He had the money, he had gold, he had the fame, he had the power, he had the authority. So for him, there was no need for the corner of the God. At one time, I remember he put him up a structure and say every person is going to worship that golden image. And there were men that came from Jerusalem who knew who their God was and they said we are not going to bow down. And they made this clear to this king. And they said let it be known to you, O king, we are not going to bow down. Even if our God is not going to deliver us, we are not going to do it. We are ready to die. The people from Jerusalem. And the king of Cardinesa was so furious, he was so mad. And he asked, which God is there that can save you from my fire? What I'm going to say here is this. Even when things don't look good, our God will always look good and feel better. Praise the name of the Lord. Which God is there that can save you from my fight came from the panic. And then the same same men who destroyed and burned down the gates of Jerusalem and you will hear functioning the authority of Almighty God. Which God is there? But before long he realized there was God of Israel, there was God of Jerusalem. That city that he burned down. There was God of Jerusalem that showed up in that lake of fire, not the fire, the, the furnace of fire, and saved the three men in the fire. Remember Goliath and David? And Goliath was, um, he was questioning whether there was God strong enough to save the Israelites from his strength and his might and his experience as a military leader. And David said, because Jerusalem is also known as the city of David. And David said, I know there is God in heaven. And because of him, I'm going to cut off your head, the birds of the air are going to see you. That's Jerusalem. Praise the name of the Lord. So it was burnt down, the walls destroyed. The gates destroyed, and all the strong people were taken from Jerusalem. Now that's where I'm picking up my, my sermon. That was just the introduction part of it. And our uh, reading here is going to come from the book of Nehemiah 1, verse number 1 to 8. If I read it, can read Nehemiah 1, chapter 1. Verse number one to eight. The word of Nehemiah the son of 
had created life to happen in the man since death in the greatest year prior I was in Susa, the, the capital. That Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity at about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province to survive the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserved the covenant and loving kindness of, of those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I have prayed before, which I have prayed before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted with collapse against you, and have not kept the commandments, nor the stages, nor the ordinances, which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are faithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. Verse 9. But if you return to me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though those of you who have been scattered who are in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. Praise the name of the Lord. So, this is Nehemiah. Nehemiah, by the way, he was not born in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah has ne had never been to Jerusalem. But he inquired about the remnants, those people that had gone back. And he was told that people are in distress and in reproach, and the walls were broken, and the gates were even burned with fire. So, this is where my sermon now starts. Even to assume, let's, actually, let's have a conversation. When you inquire about people, you have your friends, for example, what is it that you want to know about them? If you have a friend, I'm talking if you have a friend. You want to ask about them. If you have told Nere a little Kazi, if you see a Meureka, me like It's not the Nere that used to know. These are gone bad, 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 bad. What do you do? You say, I knew she could not make it. Is that the answer that we gave? I knew she will not be the person that will make it in life. And if God will not analyze that. Sometimes we are happy when we hear bad because of our friends. Especially those people that we think they are successful. If you ask about the Kamehameha, then they will put to a class. Oh, and they put to a class, they knew. And you will not make it. Because we are treated with jealous, isn't it? But Nehemiah was different. Nehemiah was saved. And my name is not from there. He was saved. He was a true servant of God. He required about Jerusalem, the Lemnites, and then he was told what was going on. What did he decide to do? Like, right on the spot. And I'm now coming to the qualities of a good leader. That was my principles. The qualities of a good leader. That's the topic of my sermon. The qualities of a good leader. From Nehemiah. And when I talk about the qualities of a good leader, I'm, I'm talking of the qualities of a good 
Christian. I'm talking of my qualities as a Christian. What is expected of me as a Christian? What is it that you're supposed to do? Number one, a good leader prays. A good Christian, let me not talk of the word leader. Let me go not do that one. A good Christian. A good Christian will always pray. When you have a problem, what is it that you're supposed to do first? Pray. And I hear people talking of what am I praying about? I don't have the words to pray. You know when you pray, you are not repeating what like what you hear that people pray. That means you're so good at that. You go to meeting and you listen to what other people pray, and you think that is a standard way of praying. God will understand any language, any word. It doesn't have to be an English word. God will understand any language. There is no standard language of praying. God is looking for a broken heart to go before the Lord and tell God, this is what I want. Praise the name of the Lord. When he heard about Jerusalem, though he had never been there, but this guy knew Jerusalem was the place where God's seat is supposed to be. Jerusalem is supposed to be where the temple is supposed to be. Jerusalem is supposed to be where the Ark of Covenant is supposed to be. And if that place is broken down, if there are no walls, there's a need and no security. And he prayed to God. Praise the name of the Lord. He prayed. And as a Christian, when you hear things are not moving in the right direction for your friends, for your neighbors, for your church members, for your leaders in whatever country, whether in Kenya or in the USA, because that's the it. Things are being, not they are being, but things are broken already. Political things are not okay. Go to Kenya, things are not okay. Come to America, people are divided along racial lines, along the political lines, along ideological lines, along the gender lines. Everything has been like the way it's out. Everything is so much broken. When we see the brokenness around us, as Christians, as leaders, what is it that we do? Do we just ignore? As it doesn't bother me? I'm not a political leader. By the way, this guy Nehemiah, he was not a political leader. Before this time, he was not even known in Jerusalem. But his commitment, his commitment to do the right things, drove him to his knees to pray and to seek the face of God. Praise the name of the Lord. And I did not mention this, but Nehemiah used to work as a cup bearer for the king. And the cup bearers, there are those people that were so much trusted by the kings because in those days people were so much afraid to be poisoned or to be assassinated. So before the king ate his food or drink his drink, the cup bearer would take the bread for the king. He would, he would taste fast. If the meat was supposed to be eaten by the king, the mayor would eat that meat first before the king. If the king was drinking the wine before the king would drink the wine, Nehemiah would drink that wine first. So in other words, he ate what the king ate. And for this man to be trusted by the king to be the cup bearer, it means the king trusted Nehemiah so, so much. Praise the name of the Lord. So when he said, when he heard that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, he prayed and fasted. Pray then, two things. Pray then, fasted. Some of us don't like the second word. We don't like to fast. We just like praying for two minutes. If we are lucky, two minutes. But prayer and fasting, they both make the true meaning of prayer. There's no shortcut. 
and you don't fast so that you punish your body. You, you fast so that you may tune your spirit to reason to the things of heaven. Praise the name of the Lord. So there are no escapes. If you want to have the true result of a good Christian, we must teach ourselves to pray and fast. And when you fast, because these days, I've seen this, we have so many ways of fasting, isn't it? A part of dry fasting, a part of wet fasting, a part of partial fasting, a part of so many. You got to fast fast, praise the name of the Lord. Don't fast and take porridge. Why are you not fasting? You're not fasting. Praise the name of the Lord. If you are fasting, fast. If you're not eating, eat. By the way, Jesus fasted how many days? Four days? <laughs> Forty days. Did he die? Some of us when we miss lunch. One lunch. And in between all of your meat, you have taken yogurt, taken juice, have taken soda, and you are still complaining you are happy at the end of the day. My friends, my sister, my brother is not fasting. Better eat and say I ate and I will fast tomorrow. Praise the name of the Lord. But when you fast, I'm not saying that you you go dry, you are happy and me. If you are telling God I want to fast for two days, they will not kill you. And you don't have freedom. But if there is a pressing need that you need to go before the Lord and pray and fast. You no, know, the needs that you have, it will take you to the place of prayers. If, there, if you don't have nothing that you are praying, don't even fast. But if you have needs that you need to be attended to by God, you, the need will take you to that place that you know worship and pray and eat and me don't eat don't fast and pray kama uko na mahitaji mahitaji utafanya ufunge na uombe praise the name of the lord you need the political needs your family needs there are needs you know, sometimes when you pray we don't pray because we we are, we are not strong we don't pray because we are weak. We don't pray because we are not rich or we are poor or we are educated or we are not educated. We pray because we need to talk to a super being, the powers from above. And sometimes when you go before the Lord and you know, God, I'm talking to you. I may not even have the right word to say, but God, I need your help now. Now when this guy had that the, the, the walls of Jerusalem had collapsed and he prayed and he fasted he had purpose in his life I'm going to do that praise the name of the Lord so reason number two good leaders have a genuine love for their people a good Christian I said I don't want to be the one reader a good Christian have genuine love for the people. Genuine, not fake. If you love, you love. By the way, you are Christian, loving is not an option. It's a command. And Jesus said, to, this is the command I give. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the God, your God, with all your heart, all your mind, whatever you have, then love your neighbor as you love yourself. Loving is not an option, my friends. So genuine Christian love their people. The man could have chosen to stay in part wherever he was. But because of the love of his people in, uh, in Jerusalem, he committed to do things because of this guy, because of God. Praise the name of the Lord. The other one is leaders organize and direct. Christians organize and. And now, before I come to this point here, um, there is something that I want to, to put across about the problems. 
Because when you talk about the walls of Jerusalem, you're not talking of those walls those days. We are talking of the problem that we face every single day. You get up in the morning and there's a problem before you are you are doors. Big problems. Are we winners? When you see these big problems come our way, do we quit and run away? Because we are Christians and people run away from the church. Had a problem and then nobody cared the church, then I run away. The truth is, we all have problems. Every one of us has problems. If I have to share with you the problem I have is, is even as we stand here, you don't you even, you even get the courage to stand before people and preach to them. Every one of us has needs and problems. But the problem is, sometimes when we see these problems, we feel like running away from the problems. It's going to solve anything. It helps. Just like in Nehemiah, when the problems come our way, just as Nehemiah did, he prayed. When you pray, you are preparing yourself and your soul and your spirit to fight. You are drawing the battle lines. When this problem comes, I'm not running away. How many marriages have collapsed because people are not willing to fight for their marriages? The walls of marriages, they come crumbling down. The labels, they are all over. But you're not able to pick up the pieces and rebuild our relationship again because we are, we are scared. We did not do the first thing, we did not pray. Praise the name of God. We did not pray. We did not seek God's guidance and God's answer and God's solution in everything. We ran away. We didn't pray. So good leaders of good Christians, they pray for everything. Everything. The other one is the, the good readers delegate and motivate. Praise the name of the Lord. What is to delegate and motivate? Now when you read the book of Nehemiah, the whole chapter, the whole book, there were many people in, uh, in Jerusalem. But Nehemiah uh, made sure there were people who were doing the gates, others were doing the walls, others were doing the cement, others were cutting the stones, others were putting the gates. He could not have done it all by himself. He delegated. And when you read the, some of the chapters in the, in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was careful to name names that nobody knows who these names are in the Bible. That we name Esther Karaoke, Espora Gedioni, people that are not known. You know, we are, we are used to people being named in the Bible, people that are well known. Like David and Jonathan and uh, Goliath and you know those known people. But Nehemiah, he noted those guys, those smaller people that are not known. Their names are in the Bible. He made sure he cognized all those people. Because they listened to him, they dele he delegated and motivated people. And this even come welcome to our families. As the leaders in our in our homes, in our families. Do you very much our kids? Do it. Or do we just say I'm the ghost and my words are final. Praise the name of the Lord. Those people that we are calling kids, they're not kids. They're growing up. And the product will be what you put in. So even as they do the, the shows at home, where well, they are doing the dishes, they are Doing the floors, they are making up their beds, motivate them. Praise the name of the Lord. Motivate them and delegate. Delegation means give out some responsibility. Don't do everything. Some of the kids that we are growing up with, they are our kids now, especially kids in America. In Kenya, that is something else different. In America, like a day I, was, I told them, uh, Ma. I was sitting at, uh, I think I was tired. Just got to the house and I was tired. And I wanted the remote. And the distance where the remote was, 
From where I was seated, it was closer to where it was. So he looked at me and said, why don't you wait yourself? The remote is closer to you than praise the name of the Lord. And like, Christians motivate. How do I motivate in such a company here? And uh, I'm tired, and you are younger, I'm older, and I... So we have to be very careful when we bring up our, 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 our kids. That's when the true leadership is, is required. Motivate, delegate, and motivate. Then our kids know how to make their best. They don't have them. I keep on saying this every day to my kids. And after the seventh day, they make better. I go out of race. Do I get that? No. Let's keep on delegating and motivating. If they make that bad, make a, a, a deal. If they do their shows at home, make a deal. What pay? $5, $10. Because you are training up, you are bringing them up to be responsible and mature kids when they grow up. They are never going to remain that age. When I came to America, Dave was 8 years. Now he's 21. But now see the, 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 the huge difference. When I came here, Kate was this small. He is now in university. They are growing up here. They are becoming big girls and big boys. But they will be the product of the input that we have put through them. Praise the name of the Lord. The other thing is, leaders lead by example. Nehemiah, though he was a king, he was in charge of rebuilding the, the walls of Jerusalem. He didn't say, I'm the boss. Because of there is a difference between a boss and a leader. A boss will tell you what to do. Do this, do that. Sit there and you get up and sit over there. Leaders lead from front. Not from behind. So Nehemiah would do his duties at night and sometimes you do his duties during the day. He not just give orders for the world to be built when he did nothing. So a good Christian, and when I say a good Christian, say you, you read by example. Praise the name of the Lord. If you want the house done, I don't have a family. So my mini dear mama, and I'm tired, you just clean the house and I'll just sleep. And you, a father, lead by example. Even at work. Lead by example. And the only way that you can do this one is don't let your ego come between you and your responsibilities. What do I mean by your ego? Your, your, your personality. Sometimes we let our education start in our head. Me, 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 so, my son. So? What does that mean to you? <laughs> Sometimes I don't get it. I'm so much educated. I have a PhD. I'm a doctor. I'm talking about it for us. But, what about it? Because you're educated, you cannot do the dishes, Nicholas? Have <laughs> <laughs> you seen the dishes? Yes. Because your wife is working at night and you have a PhD, you are doctor so and so, you cannot cook. You don't cook because you are, you are so much, even you are a manager where you are. I'm not talking about that your positions and your responsibilities elsewhere, you bring them to your home. Good leaders lead by example. Praise the name of the Lord. I don't want more of that. The other thing is the seat of position to your work. The seat of position. And uh, when you're talking of solving problems, let me give the example of marriage here. And I use Paul as an example. 
So if you have a fight between me and her, um, some people will try to divide us. Cora is bad, George is bad, John is a dream, why don't we default, why don't we do a BCD? There are people that don't want to see us together. And they'll try all they can to divide us. But as Christians, what are you supposed to do? Assist opposition. Nehemiah, he didn't have a smooth ride all the way. There were people who opposed him. You know, there are people, there are three categories of people. There are those people that do not want the world to be built. They are not interested. The stories of building the wall, they didn't make it in their mind. There are those people who did not support at all, with money, with effort, nothing. But yet there were those people that resisted the rebuilding of the wall. That means they did not only oppose and did uh, not support, they fought Nehemiah so the wall should not be built. What is bigger now? They fought. Read chapter. And when you read chapter 6 of Nehemiah, there was one time they, they were planning to kill him. Because they told let's meet in a very isolated place away. So that you can have a talk. And they actually wanted to kill Nehemiah because they did not want the world to be revealed. Even in our relationships, even in our careers, even in our professional careers, there are those people that want to bring you down. Because they think you are going too far. You are rising too fast in your, in your job or whatever. And they're not happy. Don't think that everybody will celebrate with you when God promotes you. There are those people that when God promotes you from one grade to the other, people don't go to the party because they think you are doing so well. They want to bring you down. They want to resist you. They want to show you that you, can, you have not achieved anything. So when opposition comes as a Christian, don't quit. Resist in the name of Jesus. Don't go away. Don't let people convince you that you know you have not achieved anything. Don't let people who whisper to you that you cannot make it. Because those little voices that come and tell you cannot make it. And you listen to them. It's those little things that will make you quit. And the devil knows that. The devil knows that he wants to make you fail. And you come disguised so that you preach. If you pray just like this guy pray, if you pray, God will keep you on the cross that need to be on lookout. Don't fall in into the temptations of the devil because he wants you to quit so that you don't accomplish what God intended you to do. You are designed to be a winner. You are made to be a victim. You are not made to fail along the way. And don't let people bring up ideas that you cannot make it. Sometimes studying on your own, it will give you better results. Than when you seek counsel from those people that you think, not everybody will give you the right advice. People will tell you to quit. People will tell you try something else. Don't quit. And instead of seeking counsel from those people, why don't you seek counsel from, from God? Praise the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ was tempted. You know why he was being tempted? So that you would quit. So that you would quit being the sacrifice that God had intended to save the mankind. If Christ had Quit those days. I will not be standing here because there will be no Christianity without the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the devil knew that. Because the Son of God command the stones to become bread. The Son of God, why don't you throw yourself from the top of the of the temple and the angels will be sent so that you don't have to have your feet? 
Because the Son of God, I'll give you all the things this world, if only you bow to me. Some of us cannot trust the three temptations. That's true. We cannot trust the three temptations. Especially the one that touches the personality. The superwoman that was created in the garden of Eden, Eve. Even to Arionetta to Just one truth. Just one. And she failed that test. One fruit. And the devil showed up and asked her, Did God really say that you should not eat and touch? And God has said, Thou shalt not eat. And the devil came and said, Did God really say you should not touch and eat? He don't need the word touch to bring confusion. And the Bible says when Eve looked at the fruit, what did she see? The fruit was good for food. So not even hungry. The Bible says she was living in a garden of fruits, not in a forest. The Bible does not say that these guys were living in a forest. They were living in a, in a garden of fruit trees. So they were not hungry. But when this woman looked up at the fruit and looked and said, This one is good for food. That one I jump. So that she wasn't hungry. Adam was not hungry either. But because they allowed a conversation with the, with the devil, that's the worst thing that you can ever do. Don't engage in a conversation with someone that is going to bring you down. Don't. Because some one way or another, they will bring you down. So resist opposition by praying, by being smart. The other thing is quick decisions and action. Praise the name of the Lord. Quick decisions and action. Now let me say this. Some of the problems that we face, we don't act on them because either we don't plan or we are not quick at making decisions. Problem solving and it revolves around making decisions. Sometimes it's not decisions. Praise the name of the Lord. Take for example going back to school. You know, there are people saying, oh, I'm poor, I can't go back to school. I can't go back to school, I can't do that, I can't start a business, I can't do ABCD. You confess you are failure even before you start. Praise the name of the Lord. Do you know how many business, all the businesses that I've started, that is the one that you see all over, somebody made a decision one day. A quick, decisive decision. I want to start a business. One time there are no aeroplanes. You know that. There was a time there are no aeroplanes. But two crazy guys called the Wright brothers. They said, Why can't we try something that, that, that can try and see what will happen? Two crazy guys. There's one time there was no internet, and I wonder how we survived without internet, with the name of the Lord. Internet today has become the, the thing that you know, connects people. There was one person that said, let us try that. A decision was made, very decisive action. Even at homes, at our, at our places of work, I mean our relationships, there are things that can move if you have the courage to make the right decisions. But sometimes we are scared to ask people. We are scared of what the, of the tomorrow what the tomorrow holds. But if you want to have results, you want to be the people that you solve problems. We must learn how to make decisions and action. One last question. Nothing will ever come 
if you don't make no decisions. So as a good reader, as a good Christian, let us not plan to miracles. Not plan to necessarily miracles. Everything is miracle. You go for the revival meeting, you have a problem. I want to be prayed for. Sometimes it works, but 99% it don't work. It's not a miracle, 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 miracle. Miracles don't work like that. If the miracles happen all the time, God Himself would have said, Let the world be. The black attack in a minute. But God worked. Praise the name of the Lord. If God worked, the one who made all the heavens and the earth and everything. And every time I have a problem, I, I run for a miracle. And by the way, you read the book of Genesis, the first, the first two verses. The Bible says that the world was covered with water and there was darkness. That is not what God had created. But the Bible says there was, there was uh, the water covered the surface of the earth and there was darkness. But God said, let us so from the waters and from the darkness, God created the thing that we know of today. In 76 days. Because he had a plan. He made decisive action. And the decision and everything. So even us people, when you have problems, going for a quick fix solution will not help. Sometimes you need to pray, you need to work against opposition, and you need to make quick decision and action. Praise the name of the Lord. The other one is, as a good Christian, just as Nehemiah, we learn to depend on God in everything. If you are a Christian, learn to put your eyes on the Lord. David said, I will lift up my eyes unto the mountains, and that's where my help comes from. That's what we need to do. As a good, good Christian, we should never run away from looking upon God for help. Doesn't matter how much salary you make. Doesn't matter how much uh, education you have. And finally, you need a plan. Praise the name of the Lord. Have a plan. When you have a problem that you have to solve, pray, seek God, uh, make decisive action, listen to God, whatever it is that you have to do. But finally, have a plan. God says, I, have, I know the plan that I have for you, seek the Lord. So God works with plans. And even the children of God, and God works with plans, who do you think that you are if you don't have a plan? When I ask you a son. So how do you solve problems? When you get up one morning and you find all that you have been building for years, all those things that you have built, the walls, have collapsed. You wake up in the numbers. You have built a business for 20 years. You get up one morning, you are facing bankruptcy, the business has, has closed, there are no sales. What do you do? Do you get, you go to the Walmart, buy a gun and put a bullet in your head because your business has failed? What do you do when you wake up one morning and you find your marriage of 20 years is gone? You only have those labels at your feet? What do you do? Get a rope and have yourself until you have been dead? What do you do when you get up one morning and you have been having this job? And one morning you are told you are no longer going to work here, you are fired. What do you do? What do you do? Because things will happen. Things will happen. 
So what do you do? You pray fast. Don't let the, the, the forces or the circumstances drive you to do things that you're not supposed to do. Seek the face of God, pray, but have a plan. You know when you are sober, you always get a very clear answer. But when you are not, when you are surrounded by those circumstances, you don't think straight. Because right now you don't know how many of us are facing those rubbles, those stones, those walls that you have built over here, they are falling down. You right there and you're wondering what are you going to do. This is what the Lord has for you. I know the path I have for you. How to give you a future, the hope. Even when there is hopelessness, God is still God. When the walls of death for me of Jerusalem came down, when I'm going to be the soldiers to burn the gates of Jerusalem, when those people were taken away from their home, from their temple, from the, the pray they worship every day, from their parents, from their children, from their husband, from their wife, from their kids, for many years, at one time they thought God did not care. Praise the name of the Lord. But He did care. Just as He cared then, He still cares for you now. So those rebels, those things that you think have come down, falling on you, don't even know what to do. I have a secret. I have an answer to what you're supposed to do. Lift up your eyes at the Lord. Don't quit. Pray. Pray, 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 pray. Seek the peace of God. And don't let those people that tell you cannot rise up again. Don't listen to those voices. Sometimes I, I, I say this. That my ears are not a dust pit to hear the things of the devil, but they are holy ears to hear the things of God. I want to hear I can make it. I want to hear God is on my side. I want to hear I can rise up again on my feet. I want to hear just like Jesus Christ died and was buried for three days and that day he rose up again. I want to hear of my resurrection. I want to hear of the good thing that God has planned over my life. I don't have to tell, I want to, I don't be told you are done. I don't be told that your coffin is, is here. We are putting the last layer of your coffin. I am a Christian. I am made for greatness. I am made to be a winner. I am made to be whole again. Praise the name of the Lord. So I am not promising that things will be lost and lost. Things will be bad. But you know what? We have Jesus on our side. Praise the name of the Lord. We have Christ on our side. We have heavens on our side. We have angels on our side. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid, brothers and sisters. Even when things are crumbling down. The relationships, our careers, our friends. And even when things start going wrong, in your marriage, in your families, and whatever, as a Christian, Stand up and confess and prophesy and declare and declare in Jesus' name that everything is going to be okay in the name of Jesus Christ. That you are going to work together to have a solution in Jesus' name. Don't be a sheer leader for the for your downfall of your family. Don't be a sheer leader. Stand on your ground and confess and declare to your people. Though this one is coming down, but we are going to work together as a family and we are going to stand because this is what God wants us to do. We are not going to die. We are not going to quit. We are not going to, to go to the bankrupt and all that. Stand at your place as a Christian. Don't turn away from a place of faith. Don't turn away from a place that you need to stand. Take your position and stand and see what God can do. Take your position, your position of faith. That prayer that you kneel down to pray, don't quit on that place. Go on your knees, fast pray and seek the face of God. But you cannot afford to lose hope, you cannot afford to quit. 
Because if you put that the whole thing, the devil is going to celebrate. Don't give him the, a reason to go to the party celebrating your not for. Give him a reason to fight you because he's also fighting back. Hard because you want to be. Praise the name of the Lord. I mean, pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word this afternoon. My Father,